I think I put some, I don't know if others have already put it on their calendar. But anyway, either way, we can we can we can make the changes. Um, all right. Mr. Young, could you just get us started, please? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today's date is November 1st, 2021. We are convening and broadcasting this public hearing by video conferencing. My name is Anthony Hood, and I'm joined uh, by Vice Chair Robert Miller, Commissioner Shapiro, Commissioner May, and Commissioner Ema Mora. We're also joined by the Office of Zoning Staff, Ms. Sharon Schellen, and Mr. Paul Young, who will be handling all of our virtual operations, and Ms. Hillary Lovick, who is our Office of Zoning Legal Division Counsel. I will ask others to introduce themselves at the appropriate time. The virtual public hearing notice is available on the Office of Zoning's website. This proceeding is being recorded by a court reporter, and the platforms used are Webcast Live, WebEx, and YouTube Live. The video will be available on the Office of Zoning's website after the hearing. All persons planning to testify should have signed up in advance and will be called by name at the appropriate time. At the time of sign up, all participants will complete the oath or affirmation required by subtitle Z48.7. Accordingly, all those listening on WebEx or by phone will be muted during the hearing and only those who have signed up to participate or testify will be unmuted at the appropriate time. When called, please state your name, and home address before providing your testimony. When you are finished speaking, please mute your audio. If you experience difficulty accessing WebEx or with the telephone or with your telephone call in or have not signed up, then please call our OZ hotline number 202-727-5471. If you wish to file written testimony or additional supporting documents during the hearing, then please be prepared to describe and discuss it at the time of your testimony. Today's subject of today's zoning commission case is number 21-13. Uh, today's subject topic is, this is a uh, design review and approval of the new construction in the Northern Howard Road Zone District. The hearing will be conducted in accordance with provisions of 11 ZD, CMR chapter four as follows, preliminary matters, applicant's case, the applicant has up to 60 minutes, but I believe they can do it in uh, 20 or less. Uh, report of other uh, report of Office of Planning and Department of uh, Transportation. The report of the government of other government agencies. Report of the ANC. In this case, we have ANC 8A and 8C. Re uh, testimonial organizations will have five minutes. Individuals will have three minutes, and we will hear in the following order from those who are in support, opposition, or undeclared. The rebuttal and closing by the applicant. Again, the OZ hotline number is 202, <clears throat> 727-5471 for any concerns during this proceeding. Before I go to Ms. Shellen, I do have two preliminary matters. The first one is, uh, as we know this morning, we received the sad news of the loss of former council member here in Ward 5. I think Ms., uh, Commissioner Miller, he's been around a little bit, so I'm sure he remembers Bill Spaulding. So if, I, if you could all do this, do me a favor, and let's take a moment of silence for the former council member, um, Bill Spaulding. Thank you. Also, we want to rec recognize we have a new commissioner, Mr. Eva Moore, who uh, comes with a wealth of knowledge. Uh, I've, I've, I've done some of my research on him. I think he has he's going to make a major contribution to our discussions and to our activities we here, have here on the Zoning Commission. So we want to officially welcome you to the Zoning Commission of the District of Columbia. He, he represents the architect of the Capitol. I will tell you that you have some big shoes to fill. I've served with Herb Franklin, Peter, Peter May, uh, Kevin Hildebrand and Mike Turnbull. I think I've served with a number of, of architects and I, I don't think I left anybody out. Okay. So anyway, but I, I, with your credentials, we're looking forward to it. Looking forward to learning from you. And if you have something to say, I'll just give you that time at this moment. Uh, thank you, Chairman Hood. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you all. Uh, my esteemed colleagues here, uh, as you said, Chairman Hood, uh, a lot of great men have come before me, so uh, I'm eager to step into the role and uh, contribute to uh, the commission. So, thank you. Again, on behalf of all of us, glad to have you on board and looking forward to working with you. Okay, at this time, the commission will consider any preliminary matters. Does the staff have any preliminary matters? Just a couple. Um, the applicant 
filed a motion to um, waive having to get an affidavit of posting and maintenance. They've filed these, but they've just done a certification. Um, it's difficult to get out and get it notarized. So we just ask if by consensus, the commission would waive that requirement. Okay, any, any objections? Not seeing or hearing any. Okay. Um, for proffered expert witnesses, um, Rob Schiesel has already previously been approved, accepted as an expert. Um, so he's been proffered. He's the easy one since you guys have already previously accepted him. Just ask that you accept him in this case. Any objections to continue our uh, status? No objections. Okay. Then we have Brian Earl of CGF Architects. He's being proffered in architecture. His resume is at Exhibit 10B, as in boy. Okay, do we have any objections to Mr. Brian Earl from ZG, ZGF Architects? Okay, no objections. Okay. All right. Anything else, Michelle? Um, just real quick, uh, Megan Hoddle Cox and John Epstein are the representatives from Goldston and Stores. ANC 8A and 8C are the two A affected ANCs. You have Matt Jessick from OP and Kimberly Vaca from DDOT this evening to present. That's it. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Mr. Young, if we can bring the presenters up. And again, we don't, I don't think we need to go over 15 to 20 minutes. I think the record is pretty straightforward, it speaks for itself. And I don't recall seeing any, any opposition, at least I didn't see any, but you know, sometime it comes in after I've looked at it. Okay, so Ms. Hollercox, we'll turn it over to you and you all may begin. Thank you very much, Chairman Hood. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Megan Hoddle Cox, and I, along with my colleague John Epting, are attorneys with Goulston and Stores. We are here today asking the commission for design review approval of the first building in the Northern Howard Road zone. The applicant has been working thoroughly since the NHR zone was established in 2019 to create a master plan for the bridge district, this area along Howard Road, adjacent to the Anacostia Metro Rail Station between South Capitol Street and the Anacostia Freeway. We're very excited to be presenting the first building in the NHR zone to the commission, a highly designed mixed use building that will serve as the cornerstone of the bridge district. The project will provide approximately 748 residential units with significant affordable housing, including three bedroom affordable units and approximately 45,000 square feet of retail on the ground floor. The proposed building meets or exceeds all of the zoning requirements in the NHR zone. This includes the 12% inclusionary zoning requirement at 60% and 50% of the median family income and the increased sustainability benefits and solar panels. The applicant has also detailed in the record how the project will achieve the goals and requirements of the NHR zone, including the applicant's ongoing internship program for local high school and college students, current work with local businesses and future commitments to local businesses as part of the project. The project is consistent with the district's comprehensive plan, including through a racial equity lens. This was addressed by the applicant in the initial filing and an OP's report in significant detail in pages nine through 11. Specifically, the project provides significant market rate and affordable housing, increased sustainability, neighborhood serving retail, and does not result in any displacement of existing residents. The project will provide, as I said, approximately 748 residential units where none currently exist, including a significant number of affordable units. Providing additional housing, particularly market rate housing in Ward 8 is a priority of the comprehensive plans, racial equity lens, and in the mayor's housing equity report. Additionally, given the past concentrations of negative environmental impacts on marginalized populations in DC, the project's, en the project's enhanced sustainability also serves these goals. Finally, I would note the preferred use of retail here along the ground floor, including a planned grocery store in an area where there is a dearth of food stores serves the goals of equity in the comprehensive plan. Therefore, we believe the project is directly consistent with these goals. 
As I know the Commission is aware, we have worked closely with ANC's 8A and 8C regarding the NHR zoning plans, the map amendments with all planning for the bridge district, and now with this design review case. We are pleased to be here with support from both ANC 8A, where the property is located, and ANC 8C, which is across Howard Road. Those support letters are in the record at Exhibits 15 and 16, respectively. The applicant has also worked with the Anacostia bid regarding the bridge district, including the project, which Britt will address in more detail. In addition to the community, the applicant has worked closely with district agencies regarding the project. We appreciate the Office of Planning organizing an interagency meeting, which allowed us to meet not only with OP, but also DDOT, DOEE, DHCD, the Department of Public Works, the Department of Parks and Recreation, and DC Water. We are pleased to be here this afternoon with support from the Office of Planning, who included comments from DOEE and DHCD in their report. With respect to OP's comment regarding the three bedroom IZ units, we believe the proposed location and design of these apartments provide the best family sized and oriented units, which Brian will provide greater detail on. The applicant has also worked closely with DDOT throughout this application process, and we are also pleased to be here today with support from DDOT. We have been in communication with DDOT regarding the conditions in their report, and we believe we have come to agreement with them on all of the outstanding issues. Rob will detail those conclusions in his testimony. With that, we have three witnesses this afternoon. Britt Snyder with Red Brick will discuss the project's goals within the overall master plan and coordination with the community. Brian Earle with ZGF, the project architect, will walk you through the project design. And Rob Schiesel with Grove Slate Associates will detail the project's transportation plan. Britt? Thank you very much, Megan. And good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Zoning Commission. My name is Britt Snyder and I'm a principal at Red Brick LMD. Red Brick is a DC based real estate investment and development firm with offices located in both downtown DC and in historic Anacostia. Thank you for the opportunity to present testimony in support of the design for our proposed multifamily and retail mixed use project located in the NHR zone in Ward 8. This proposed development is the first of seven buildings in a multi-parcel multi project that we are calling the Bridge District. Given its location along Howard Road and Ward 8, between and with immediate proximity to the new Frederick Douglass Memorial Bridge and the soon to be constructed 11th Street Bridge Park. At Red Brick LMD, we are very focused on bringing economic development and job opportunities to Ward 8, including the Anacostia and Congress Heights neighborhoods. As I mentioned to this commission recently on another matter, we began construction on the new Whitman Walker Health headquarters up at St. Elizabeth's a couple of months ago, as well as 88 new townhomes, including significant for sale affordable housing. And earlier this year on our bridge district assemblage, we hired a Ward 8 general contractor, FNL Construction, to demolish the existing vacant buildings and clear the site. We continue to find ways of working with local businesses any chance we get. First, a little bit of history on our bridge district land. Some of you may recall that Red Brick initiated and achieved a PUD that was then appealed and eventually abandoned. Red Brick then submitted to the Zoning Commission by way of proposed map and text amendments coordinated with the Office of Planning, a new zoning designation for the assemblage called North Tower Road or NHR. This new zoning designation was reviewed and approved by the Zoning Commission in 2019. We're excited to be here today presenting the first design review project in the NHR zone. We are presenting a design to the Zoning Commission that meets or exceeds all of the requirements of the NHR zone and hopefully moves us one step closer to creating an activated, vibrant new neighborhood where no development exists today. Our design team is phenomenal and you'll hear more about them shortly on the details of this building. In addition to meeting the requirements of the NHR zone, we also feel that this first project and our larger master plan, which I might add won the award for best master plan by the DC chapter of the AIA, is entirely consistent with urban planning principles of having higher density mixed use nodes located next to and or connecting to transit hubs. While this area is currently inactive and the northern entrance to the Anacostia Metro Station is significantly underutilized, our hope is to tap into the transit network and other infrastructure already in place here to create a welcoming mixed use environment that people can easily access from all over the district and the region. We've worked closely with both ANC 8A and 8C on this effort and are happy to be here with support from both of them. Both ANC submitted letters in support over the weekend and we, we've met with them on several occasions, both formally and informally, regarding the design of this project. We look forward to continuing our work with the ANCs and also the Anacostia bid on this project. 
The overall plan for the bridge district incorporates an appropriate mix of multifamily office and curated retail uses that provide for an active daytime and evening population that embraces the community around it. The multi building development will serve as a leader in sustainability, sustainability, health and wellness in the district using thoughtful design and engineering while incorporating local businesses as well as local community art and culture. This mixed use development will also provide hundreds of both construction and permanent jobs, internships, apprenticeships, and other forms of workforce training to enhance the skills of Ward 8 residents. In addition to the 748 residential units on this project, we're proposing approximately 45,000 square feet of ground floor and mezzanine commercial use. In addition to some inline retail space, we have signed letters of intent for an urban grocer on the west end of the site and a local brewer for a brewery slash restaurant on the east end of the building. We're excited about these destination retailers coming to the bridge district. And as required by NHR, the NHR zone, this project incorporates 12% inclusionary zoning units and significant housing where no housing currently exists, including many three bedroom affordable units. And I wanna reiterate that no residents will be displaced by moving forward with any of the development projects at the bridge district. The NHR zone also has stringent sustainability requirements, which we are happy to take on and will strive to exceed. Sustainability sits at the core of Red Brick's business, and this first building is no exception as we target the highest levels of sustainability. Finally, all the buildings in the NHR zone require design review by the Zoning Commission to ensure that each building's design meets the requirements described in the regulations. So the Zoning Commission will be seeing a lot of us in the coming months and years, and we look forward to those discussions to bring this transformational multi-building project to reality. In closing, Red Brick is excited about the design of our first proposed project, and believe it meets or exceeds all of the requirements of the NHR zone, while also delivering on a number of the district's goals, namely providing both market rate and affordable housing where none exists today, pushing the envelope of sustainability and also engaging the community in a far more meaningful way than most other, other developers do. We are requesting that the Zoning Commission vote to support our design for this first project at the Bridge District and appreciate your consideration. And with that, I will turn it over to Brian Earl with ZGF Architects. Thank you. So my name is Brian with ZGF Architects and Washington DC office. I'm a principal. Um, Paul, would you mind pulling up the slide deck that we submitted? And then I will walk you quickly through. We have a lot of slides here, um, but we'll cover them quickly and can obviously go back and answer any questions you have. Um, so the next slide here, um, as Britt mentioned, um, this site is in the what, what is called the Bridge District, um, part of the uh, North Howard Road plan. It is on the south banks of the Anacostia River, right at the foot of the New Frederick Douglas Bridge. The next slide here shows uh, what the site looked like as of a few months ago. Um, it is a, um, a, a vacant site, um, and it is surrounded on two sides by highways, the Suitland Parkway and the Anacostia Freeway, and really will perform uh, with the completion of the Frederick Douglass Bridge, this and the larger Tower Road District will um, serve as a really important link to the Anacostia neighborhood and the city beyond. Uh, the next slide here uh, shows what it looks like from the river. It is highly visible and as such will, will play a role in the identity of the surrounding neighborhood. Um, and uh, next slide, as, as Britt noted, it is part of the North Howard Road District, which was approved in 2019 as a special zoning district. Um, the, that underlying zoning became the foundation of the Bridge District Master Plan, which Red Brick completed in 2020. That master plan has a series of key principles that we've developed the building around. This next slide here shows, shows those. Uh, really, uh, Red Brick is focused on the design team on creating a unique and welcoming place, an urban walkable area um, that puts nature at the forefront and takes advantage of the, uh, frankly, wealth of, of outdoor amenities in this part of the city. We want to connect it to the city and to the river. And as we all are, these all of these elements, really, I think we've all come to appreciate them at a greater level as we've, over this last year and a half that we've spent at home. And, and that's become a real focus as we develop the design of these residential units, this idea of how do we thrive in the normal. And we'll talk a bit more about that later, but the units in general are larger than typical units in the downtown core. Over 87% of them have balconies. And they've also incorporated places, little nooks and spaces for people to work from home. 
really trying to adapt to, to how we're going to be uh, living and working in the coming decades. Next slide here. Um, we'll orient you to the master plan. Again, looking at the city beyond our site is on the northwest corner. It is the closest to the Frederick Douglass Bridge. And when when the master plan is complete, we'll create, be part of a stitch that connects um, uh, the, the Frederick Douglass Bridge to the Anacostia Metro Station. The next slide here. And I'll walk you through briefly the master planning principles. So again, our site is on the northwest corner. We've rotated the camera, so the uh, north is actually to your left, and that's where the Frederick Douglass Bridge is. You can see the the parking garage of the metro station on the right, and then the main metro station entrance is actually across Anacostia Parkway uh, to the south. Um, the this district is really oriented around uh, two key linear uh, progressions, and this next slide shows that here. The first being Howard Road, um, which is conceived as an as an urban walkable street, uh, highlighted in red as a wealth of retail along that frontage. And then, as a counterpoint to that, this kind of urban dense location, the the north side is envisioned as a as a more nature friendly, slower paced pedestrian and bike promenade um, that Redbrick is working with. The National Park Service on on that side, and then connecting between those are a series of smaller north-south connections, and they alternate. And the purple are vehicular and service connections, and then between them, there's a pair of uh, more pedestrian-focused connections, and that's really key as we understand the the parcel three-four site that we're here to present to you today. Uh, the next slide here zooms in, and we'll show you the ground floor plan of our project. Um, the property. And the full extents of the property are highlighted in red. That is the scope of this proposal. Um, but we've taken the liberty of showing you the, the, the future master plan vision, which I think is really important to how this building works. Um, and key to its design was the decision very early on to move the service functions into the middle of the building on a public access way that will eventually, uh, uh, we're working with DDOT to make sure it enables connections to the future Poplar Point development. Um, and that's important because it, it frees up the eastern and western ends for two uh, really important anchors to the development. One, the grocery store that Britt mentioned, um, and two, the, the food and beverage retailer as it's labeled here, which is the brewery uh, slash restaurant. And then stitching between them along Howard Road are the main building entrances, the two, two building lobbies for the residents shown in orange, along with inline retail. And really what this does is create a true four-sided development. There is no back. Um, and that's really important to create that rich pedestrian experience. It's so important. The other thing that did that alley did here, and if you flip to the next slide here, you'll see an image of that alley, that the public access way, and we've stepped the building back to open it to the sky, uh, and then sheltered the loading docks underneath the residential tower above, with retail wrapping the corners. It creates this really kind of inviting connection uh, back, but that also is really important by locating this in the middle of the building this way. It really frees up the what would have typically been the service access off of between this and the next parcel to be a, a really rich pedestrian space, which is shown here on the next slide. Um, it's just something we're very excited about. And this is, um, we're calling the pedestrian plaza. We're working through the development of this, but lots of outdoor seating for the brewery here. Uh, and it's a place for the community to spill out um, uh, and really have a place to get outdoors uh, and connect between that important connection between Howard Road and the future promenade. Uh, the next slide here, We'll take you up a level. So as as we go up the building, the second this is the second floor, and you can see that the residential component, which makes up the bulk of the building, 12 stories, um, is arranged in a similar barbell fashion as the as the lower floors. But what it enables on these levels is a rich array of terraces um, that break down the massing of the building and provide a, a variety of outdoor spaces. We have fitness areas, we have outdoor gathering spaces, we have more quiet contemplative spaces. Um, all with different orientations, better for different seasons. As you move up the building, um, the residential footprint continues. We wanted to highlight here for you, the next slide here shows the typical floor, an all residential with a distributed core. The next slide here highlights the location of the IZ units, which was a, a subject of discussion. I'm sure you read the report from OP. And what we've tried to do here is to distribute those equally throughout the floor plate. Some on Howard Road, uh, the majority of them, frankly, on the north side to take advantage of those really fantastic views. And we've nestled the three bedroom units in the inside corners, and that's for a couple of reasons. They're on the north side, again, taking advantage of that really great view, but 
But also this is an area that has a deeper floor plate and ability to fit the square footage necessary for one of those units. And then we've carved back the corners to open them up, provide daylight and views. Um, they are some of the few units that don't have balconies. And that really was a balancing act. You know, the, what we've seen in the market is that um, as you get in these larger family size units, there's a real premium on indoor space that they're looking for, particularly when we have other outdoor amenities. Um, so we didn't want to give up that space to, to individual balconies, but also to maximize the light and daylight and views in these. And the next slide here shows a rendering uh, from the north side. And you can see that just, frankly, the wealth of balconies, and these aren't tiny postage stamp balconies. They're predominantly uh, six feet deep, 8, 12, 15 feet wide that, that create a rich, you know, allow the people to inhabit the facade of the building have their own individual outdoor space and also build community. And you can see in the in the corners there, that's where the IZ units are tucked back and really will have spectacular views of what you see in the foreground here, which is the, the National Park Service land, and in some cases, the river. Um, then the south side of the building on the next slide, similar again, emphasizing the amount of balconies uh, in this facade. And we've really tried to celebrate those and make those a key part of the architecture, which we'll talk a little bit more in a minute. Moving up the building, the next slide here shows the roof deck, uh, which includes an outdoor pool, amenity areas, and then more uh, apartment units. We're really trying to maximize um, the amount of, of usable space in this building. And, and then the last slide here to orient you, the last plan here that we'll show you before we walk you around the architecture is the rooftop. And this really highlights, um, it's a workhorse for sustainability for us. It's doing a lot of things. We have a an all electric, um, HVAC and domestic water system, important to eliminate the use of fossil fuels. That's supported by a solar array that's about 13,000 square feet and will provide approximately 226,000 kilowatt hours a year of power for the building. That's actually 70% higher than the zoning requirement. So that's a big win we think both for the project and for the district. In addition, there's over 19,000 square feet of green roof for almost three quarters of an acre. Um, that supports stormwater retention and detention, uh, particularly when combined with the uh, a large uh, cistern in the garage that will support that as well. So the next slide here shows a few key principles of our design. Um, we've mentioned a couple of them before, this idea of creating a place. And key to that is a livable urban street, um, bringing nature to the foreground. And then really important, given the length of this block at over 400 feet, is breaking down the scale. And creating unique elements and, and creating a that denser uh, urban feel to the neighborhood that's so important to its success and, and i want you to keep those in mind i'm going to take you now on a really quick walk around the building to get a sense of what it's going to feel like for pedestrians the next slide here shows if you're coming off suitland parkway excuse me i skipped ahead um, and that articulation is really broken down into three distinct facade types i'll show you those here so the next slide uh, shows you uh, what it's going to look like coming across the Frederick Douglass Bridge, coming off the Suitland Parkway and turning down Howard Road. Um, this is uh, what we call facade type one, which is a more vertical expression of, of super frames that create and, and push and pull and create a hierarchy of vertical elements that dance across the facade. The primary facade is a cement panel. Um, and then if you zoom in the next slide here, we'll show the base. You can see that grocery store tenant, so important to the neighborhood um, and a series of green walls that go up the building. Um, contrasted again with the warm natural colors of the building above with exposed uh, cast in place concrete columns uh, that really anchor and bring those towers down to the ground. Uh, moving down Howard Road, you'll see the, the second of the three primary facade types, facade type two on the next slide. Um, and this is a, a more frame expression. So really expressing and, and celebrating that tight grid of frame and it. We've designed it, you'll see here, at the top, how it starts to break down towards the sky, and create a series of outdoor terraces. And, and then the next slide here shows the last building, which has a much more horizontal expression. In this case, again, we're playing with these elements of the balconies and expressing them in different ways. And in this case, we're pulling forward that sharp horizontal and, and really allowing it to slide back and forth across the facade and create some play there um, as a counterpoint to a tower element on the corner that becomes an orienting element as you're approaching from the Metro. You can see the brewery at the base there. And then in these renderings, you've seen a lot of, of signage uh, for the retail. That's something we're still developing. The next slide here shows our signage plan. 
um, that breaks down the signage. The short, the short and sweet here is we're complying with the with the zoning ordinance uh, for signs and sizing them according to both the retail and the uh, residential limits in the code. And are proposing a variety of sign types to really celebrate and enhance the retail. The next slide here shows that mix of blade signs and wall signs and the like um, that will support that. So again, much more to come that will be finalized uh, with the retail tenants as they come on board, but really looking for uh, signage to support the wayfinding of the neighborhood. And then lastly, I'm gonna walk you now around the north side really quickly so you get a sense of this future promenade that Redbrook is working so hard on and what it will feel like to be on the back side of these buildings. So again, this is the north east corner. You're looking at building one in the foreground. You can see building that's not type two in the middle. Rich, rich tones of cement panels, varying textures to create warmth along the park there. The next slide uh, zooms in and you can see the base of the second building. Um, and again, that play of these pixelated frames, in this case, they become taller and two and three story elements along the base and, and they stretch out over that public access way just to the left of the tower. That's where the public access way comes through and allows that feature connection to Poplar Point. And then there's a, a, a little array of building amenities that will allow the residents to come out on this side of the building. And then lastly, the last rendering here, and this is where I'll stop and turn it over to Rob is a view from the northwest corner. This is, again, the most prominent corner facing towards the river and they, they link through that, that multi-story facade expression of, of playful elements that dance along the facade. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rob. He's gonna tell you, probably tell you to skip ahead quite a bit because he's gonna go <laughs> real quick. Yes, good evening, commissioners. Um, my name is Rob Shees. I'm a principal Grove Slade Associates, and I'll be talking about the project's transportation elements. Uh, I believe I did hear Commissioner Hood ask that we keep it short. So with that in mind, uh, can we skip us ahead to slide 42? That's also Grove Slade number 10. Um, and if we need to, we can come back to the other slides if you have questions, and I, and I can love to tell you all the details about the transportation uh, components of the site. So our report is in the record. Um, and during our time working on the project and assembling the report, we had um, a lot of meetings and discussions with DDOT, including the analysis that summarized in the report, but mainly a lot of talk around the transportation site design elements. Um, some of that is uh, that feedback's been incorporated here, and, and how do you see some of the elements of the master planning that's been done? Since DDOT issued their staff report, we've had further conversations with them. And as Med Megan mentioned earlier, we have reached an agreement. Um, we sent DDOT a draft response letter, which they reviewed and agreed to the language contained within. So we're going to finalize that, um, have everything on the record, and we'll get that onto the record. Um, maybe the three things to clarify uh, is one, on uh, the design of the public access easement, the applicant is going is to request flexibility on the design of the easement itself. Uh, and we'll work through all those details with DDOT uh, during the public space process. Um, we requested a change in one of DDOT's requests about not leasing parking to people outside the building so that it would allow um, the applicant to share parking with future bridge district parcels if it's needed. Uh, so if there's extra parking here, they can share it or, or connect it in a way that, that is more efficient. Um, and there were some minor tweaks in the TDM plan. Um, most of them just, just language and verbiage things. Um, but like I said, we're gonna we're, we revise the TDM plan to reflect all that, and that will be included in the um, in the, what I, uh, the response memo that we're gonna upload. So with that, I'll rest on the record and we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, commissioners. And that concludes our presentation. And as Rob said, we're happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you all for your presentation. Again, I think the record is very clear that Red Brick has done a fabulous job in, in working with the community stakeholders. Um, and, and I want you to continue as I, as I was listening to the presentation, I'll say this before I forget. Uh, I, I would just encourage you, and I think I've done this before, to continue the, the reach out and outreach you've been doing with the, all the stakeholders. Because I think, um, with the, at least with this record, what I see, it looks like there's a lot of buy-in and people felt like they were heard and their participation was definitely uh, resourceful and helpful, and it was also taken. So continue to do the great work that I think you all are doing from this record, and I would just ask that you continue that. All right, let's let's uh, let's open it up and see if we have any questions or comments, or commissioners, any comments, uh, Commissioner May? Yeah, thank you. Um, so first question, um, I guess, would be for Mr. Snyder. Um, 
you know, uh, uh, much of the development is predicated on the on what happens uh, to the north and slightly east with the Poplar Point property, which has been awaiting a transfer uh, to the District of Columbia for 15, almost 16 years now. It was authorized by the Congress. Um, and I know that there's been some action lately. Um, not, I don't, I'm aware of the, you know, what, what some discussions have been with the city of late to try to restart the planning process necessary to get that transferred. Um, but it's not exactly rolling along at this moment. Um, so I'm wondering, um, you know, how, how is that coordination going from your perspective? Are you confident that what you are doing here is not going to sort of wind up being in conflict with the eventual development and plan for that area since the plan hasn't gone anywhere in like a dozen years? Uh, thank you, Commissioner May. Um, yeah, no, it's it's a it's a good question, and we're certainly not privy to the conversations uh, occurring at the district on this. But um, what we tried to do is come up with a plan that provides as much flexibility as we could for whatever could come, and we've certainly come up with our own plan of what we think it could work. Um, but and we've also looked at past plans to um, by us and by other developers um, by the district to try and come up with as much flexibility as we could here. Um, and in the interim, what would, that's, which is what we're trying to do with the National Park Service is to create this promenade, which really focuses much more on pedestrian and bike traffic to create something that will work on its own or if something is to be constructed um, on Poplar Point would be a, a really great connector no matter what happens uh, from, the, from the Metro all the way to the Frederick Douglass Memorial Bridge. So um, again, we, we think we've put together a plan of flexibility and we've worked, we've discussed this with DDOT, Office of Planning and others, and I think everyone's comfortable with where we are. Okay. All right, well, I'm longing for more information on that from the city um, for reasons that go well beyond this project. Um, there, um, and, and I have not been involved in the discussions on the, on the promenade. I'm aware that they're happening, but my staff is handling that with me directly. So I hope that's all coming along well. Um, the, there is a portion of the park development that's outside the site here that's uh, to the north, uh, northwest corner that is actually on uh, land controlled by the district. Can you tell me what the status of that is? Because a, a number of your you sort of show that in the foreground and just didn't know what the status of that is. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's something that we view as a great opportunity to um, have open space that connects to the bridge and certainly acknowledge the district's control there. Uh, the, uh, the idea would be to, there's a number of different avenues we could go, but the simplest uh, avenue appears to be a, a public access permit that uh, would be granted for some period of time, um, which I don't want to speak for DDOT, but in our conversations, it was something they seemed comfortable with as long it was, as it was open space and that in the future, they had the ability to potentially achieve value on that uh, in one form or fashion. Um, but in the meantime, having a temporary public access permit that could be used for open space, for, which we see as very complimentary, especially to our retail spilling out there. So public access permit is the is the avenue. Yeah, um, I mean, we really love to see the uh, some of the visions of Parkland um, serving these residents be realized. Um, but the idea of any sort of temporary Parkland uh, is, in light of our most recent experience, not a very good thing um, because of how it could complicate any future development at Poplar Point. So just be careful with that. Um, although it's probably not a caution to you, it's more of a caution to the city. Um, what is the deal with the, there are, in one of the drawings there, there are the, um, the alleys and the north south connectors are projecting into the park, um, into Popper Point land, the park service land there. Um, is that just indicating potential future connections or are you actually imagining that 
that's going to become part of the promenade or what? Yeah, so um, it, it is, it, those diagrams are meant to show future connections. However, the promenade that um, was presented by ZGF actually has a 60 foot promenade, which includes approximately 20 feet on our land and 40 feet on the park service land. So the, we would love to come up with a uh, you know, final agreement that could allow us the 60 foot. We think that's a very good dimension for retail spill out. Okay. Mr. Snyder, we, we sort of losing you. Sorry. Or at least I did. Sorry. You hear me now? Yeah. Is that better? Okay. Yep. I'm not, I'm not sure where you lost me, but um, well, it was approximately 60 feet is what our goal would be, which would be 20 feet on our property and 40 feet on park service. And if for some reason that didn't work out, we would still have a smaller promenade all on our property of 20 feet. Uh, we think 60 feet is a great dimension and we've been really encouraged by the um, by the conversations with uh, with your colleagues today. Okay. Yeah, um, I think the biggest question may be how how does that play into the future development of Poplar Point and, and what the city intends there? So that's a really big question because in the long run, I mean, it's all land the Congress authorized us to transfer to the district, and um, you know we fully intend to do so once we met the other requirements of the of the law. Um, okay, there. I guess I have now some architectural questions. So there, I saw in a plan somewhere where the silo was going to be added. Did that actually show up in any of the renderings? Because I didn't see it in the materials we had in advance. Maybe, maybe it was there and I just missed it. Mr. Earl. Yeah, it, does not, it does not show up in the renderings. That was a placeholder, as Britt mentioned. We are uh, there in negotiations and discussions with a brewer, and that's something that they've indicated um, is important to their program. And so we wanted to make sure that we let you guys know that it was something that, that may be necessary in the future. Mm -hmm. And it would be within the property line of this particular project, right? Exactly. Yes. All right. Um, so, um, I don't know where we're going to go with this tonight, but if we're asking for additional materials, it might be worthwhile seeing at least notionally what that might look like since it's in a pretty prominent location, uh, right along the street there. Um, uh, it would be in some of the views that you provided. Let me, let me just interrupt. I'm getting a lot of hissing, uh, hissing background noise. Uh, so I'm going to ask Mr. Snyder, if you can, I know you, you're disappearing and going back and forth. Can you just mute and let me try to identify that, where that noise is coming from? Might be me. Hold on. Is that it? Is that better? Still, I'm still getting it. Uh, a very little bit, but I don't know if others are getting it. Maybe it might be just me. Okay, it's not just me. All right, but uh, I think you're good though, Commissioner Mason. You go ahead. It's, it sounds like got quieter. Okay. Um, so uh, the other aspects of the diamond, I think. I think generally speaking, the the design is very attractive, and certainly um, it's you're showing a lot of balconies. I mean, just just a whole lot of balconies. So uh, that uh, I think. It's, I mean, it's, it's almost an unusual thing for us to see that kind of expression. Um, and, uh, especially the, you know, the, the, the long horizontals. And I, I think that's, you know, it's an interesting, um. Difference from again, what we, what we so often see, which is. Usually much more limited, um, the, uh. I will say, I have a little bit of, um, concern about. Color. Um, this is a common theme for me um, because of the use of very light colors and the tendency in Washington for light colored buildings get discolored by um, rain and soot and things like that. Um, and, um, you know, in particular, the, the very white material of the columns on 
the building at the southwest corner. So I'm not sure what number building that is, but it's the. Um, well, anyway, it, I, I'm I I don't know what you can say to satisfy me on this, but I'm I'm just concerned that it's going to wind up getting discolored over time. Do you have any thoughts on this? You're muted, Mr. Earl. Sorry about that. I was trying to make sure I wasn't the one hissing. Um, it's it's a good comment, Commissioner, and, and I really appreciate it. And and we've worked really hard. The color palette we've picked are really trying to pull in. One of the best ways we've seen to deal with that issue, right, of, of dirt appearing, is to use colors that are of natural materials and tones. And you see that through the, the depth of the facade, the, the reds and the, the, the taupes and the kind of coppery yeah. colors. Um, I, I what the other thing that will help is the material selected and we're looking at uh, cementitious panel project products uh, through body that would enable it to be washed and cleaned easily, um, which I think mm -hmm. is important to the success of that, as opposed to like a precast where it tends to, to, to get work its way into the material itself mm -hmm. um, and be hard to get out. So that's two of the ways we, we are addressing that, um, but a point well taken and, and so is it something I mean, it we'll would, be looking at closely as we finalize that that l the lighter colors just to make sure they're not too light that they would show. Yeah. So um, when you talk about the cementitious material, I mean you're talking about something that almost it's uh, like a glazed um, material, like a, a Michiha panel or something like that. Is that what you're talking about? Similar to that, an integral color through body. Um, there's a variety of materials, the, a variety of products similar to that, and, and some are even denser and more durable than Nichiha that we're looking at. But not, but not very porous, I assume. Exactly. Right? That's key. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know that. In, I don't know that we've ever seen biofilm developing on concrete products in Washington, but we certainly have had them on natural stone buildings, and we've wrestled with that uh, in the Park Service. So I yeah I'm just I'm always concerned about that. Um, certainly the the uh, the middle building um, moves away from that. Um, I I am intrigued also by this you know the 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 the, the frame expression in the buildings. I mean it's really um, much more so than again what we we so often see in Washington. Um, and and I think I like it, um, but again it's something that's it's it's really unusual. Um, the, the let's see, let me get back to my notes here. Um, I have to say, I am I'm, I'm looking at um, slide twenty five. I think can Paul, can you pull that up? I have the right number. Look at the PowerPoint that we received. The view from the southeast corner. Yeah. Looking at the brewery. Yep. Yeah. Paul, is it possible to show that? Paul, are you there? Oh, there we go. Slide, did you want me to show? Uh, yeah, that's um, uh, sorry, uh, slide 25, I think. Should be rendering southeast corner. Yeah. So, um, I think this is the most problematic example of the sort of the, the tower element. Um, I mean, I'm not opposed to the idea of having a tower element where you you know you project above the um the top it, right at the corner um especially when it's at a corner i think it, it works better than say in the middle building where it's sort of popping up in the middle but um this just feels really flimsy and i'm not saying that it really should be a lot heavier and i don't know what all the constraints are when you try to do something like this but a tower element um, I mean, I'm just not seeing the value of 
of just doubling the height of those that upper set of columns and having sort of an empty box there. It's again, I'm not I'm not suggesting that you have to heavy it up. Um, I would I would even say that that there was an earlier version of this, I think, that didn't include that tower element, and I thought that looked better. Or, or that, or I'm looking at it. I was looking at a different one, a different angle of the building, and I got confused. But I'm I'm really this just feels really awkward. Um, at the opposite end of the block, there's another one. Um, let's see where let me see that one. Yeah. Slide 22. Yeah, slide 22. Um, that one's not as as problematic because it's it's not as tall and it's not as wide, right? It just it. But I, I don't. I can't say that I love this one, but it's at least it works better than the other. The opposite thing. It's it's interesting because they're the same height. Um, so some of it might be the camera angle a little bit, but but okay. I, I see what you're saying about it. Uh, this one is more substantial, right? It feels more anchored into the building. Yeah. Well, isn't there? I mean, at the same height, but this one, you're you're talking about overall height, right? Not the not the height above where it connects to the building. Right? Yeah. I, so this yes. one this one looks more substantial, I think, because it connects to the building at the roof, whereas the other one only connects like one floor down at the other balcony. I think that would be a very simple adjustment, actually carrying that balcony, carrying that expression out on the roof to, yeah. to reduce the height of the tower element. That's a good observation, something we could look at. Yeah, I, I, it, it needs it needs something because it just, I mean, that one, I, I mean, I, I, I can't say that I'm, I love these, this kind of expression on, on office buildings in Washington or, in, or on other on apartment buildings in Washington where they just, just sort of run one part of it up at the corner um, or put a hat on it. That happens a lot where people have the, you know, projecting um, hats on the top of the building at the corner. I, I don't really love that stuff. Um, but, you know, the one in the southwest corner is is probably okay. The one on the on the southeast corner just feels really, really awkward. So, um, the stacking of the IZ units. So, I mean, that really stood out um, even before I read the OP report because it's something that often comes up as a concern, and and I can understand why the the inside corners are 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 good places to put bigger units, um, but they're. Clearly not the only place you could put bigger units. I mean, is there is there some reason why you couldn't make that three bedroom into into two one bedrooms or two one bedroom and a two bedroom? You'd probably probably two one bedrooms and and put some of those three bedroom units out on the outer edge of the building. I mean, I think there's only one that's on the outer edge of the building. You know, it 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 really does get tricky to put those smaller units in those corners for sure um, because they don't they don't need as much inboard space as that three bedroom does um, and what I think is worth noting is that 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 arrangement of three bedrooms in the inside corner is is both affordable and market rate units that we're doing that with because they work so well for that and give you that depth that's important to lay them out how many how many market rate units are are in those inside corner uh, there are three additional market rate uh three bedrooms and then there are in a couple corners where we don't have three bedrooms there's a there are nested units that are deeper yeah. one bedroom dens and studios so in total there's sorry i'm trying to do quick math here to mm -hmm. make sure I give you the right number there's another about 15 market units in those inside corners oh okay I didn't see that there were that many. Um, I, you know, I think, I mean, there, there may be a way for you to explain why it works a lot better for the larger units to be on the inside corners. Um, but I don't think you've really made the case so far. And I think you need to really explain that well 
so that we understand, you know, from a, from a, I don't know, almost from a technical perspective, why it works best for the three bedroom units. Um, I think certainly the rationale for not having balconies makes sense because if you wind up stacking balconies on the inside corners, it's just going to really take away the light that goes into those units, which are already going to be starving for light because they're on inside corners and, and they're on north facing inside corners, right? So I, I, I just feel like that's um, that that the, the balcony aspect of it makes sense. But what doesn't make sense is why that's really the best or the only places where you can have these three bedroom units. Um, so um, I think some some more attention to that. I mean, is it? I can understand why, since you can look directly into one unit from, you know, one part of that L-shaped unit into another part. It makes sense that it'd be all part of the same unit, and that yeah. be part of the rationale. But you you gotta you gotta explain that better, or you gotta come up with some other options. And maybe you're gonna wind up having to come up with other options anyway. It kind of depends on what the rest of the commission. Do. Commissioner May, I, I think you just said it better than I did, which is when you when you have smaller units there, you have you create overlook issues because they look into each other, and so wrapping the corner is important to avoid those overlook issues and the three bedrooms, other units that are large enough to do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm done answering your my questions for you. <laughs> um, that's it for me, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner May. Uh, Commissioner Shapiro, any questions or comments? I do, a few. Uh, some are just to uh, um, um, uh, concur with Commissioner May. I had the same concern about the light color, especially the the, the cast in place columns. They looked really white. Um, and so I had that same reaction. I appreciate Commissioner May's exploration of that with you, and I'm looking forward to seeing how you come back to us with that. Um, also around the three bedrooms, the, the thought that I had, and I think from you know from the racial equity lens uh, for the IZ units that are three bedroom, I think that um, I'd like to see you. Uh, another way to do this would be to add a few additional three bedroom units around the outside, even if you're keeping the three bedroom units on the corner, because it makes sense. I understand it shifts the economics a little bit, um, but I'd like to uh, understand if it why it would shift the economics so drastic so drastically that you couldn't at least add a few of those three bedroom units around the outer edge. And again, it's not instead of, because I'm kind of getting the argument uh, as to why those kind of need to be three bedroom units in the corners. So that's the way that I would approach it. And I look forward to, to hearing how you can respond to that. Um, the issue around the promenade, so, you know, the, the promenade looks beautiful and you pull it off with the National Park Service and it's even wider, it's even more beautiful, I get it. What I'm a bit confused about though is, what does it look like without the promenade? Um, uh, and even even the plans that we have, I think if I'm understanding correctly, the project that's before us has no promenade. Is that right? Uh, we have about 20 feet, I believe. It is correct me if I'm wrong in the exact dimension. Brian. But is that 20 feet part of what's before us at, with this design view case? I believe, yeah, we have a, well, I think we have the promenade. The future vision of the promenade is what's before you. Um, right, but it's the future vision of the promenade. And so, what I'm trying to figure out is if there's any issue. So, one issue is if it's a smaller promenade, Mr. Snyder. That's one issue, and I get it. I mean, I'm, I'm with your vision of the larger one, which is wonderful. Um, but I'm not even clear on the timing of the promenade, and, and so it's not clear to me what what's before us for approval, what it would look like with no promenade, which is actually what we're approving. Um, but, but again, start with just sharing the timing of the promenade as you envision it, even if we're not approving it. Well, I mean, this, the, the, you know, this project is, it's a large building, right? So it's, it's 30 to 36 months to, to construct this. And so the idea would be to hopefully during that time, be able to go through and get the, um, the design and approvals we needed to, to, uh, coincide with the delivery of this building. I mean, that would be the hope. Um, and and continue it along to the metro, and then we would obviously be developing future buildings in the future. But we would just have to protect the promenade. Right. I mean, because it is that, that, that's the hope. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a little complicated, right? Because, you know, without that promenade, that side of the building is not right <laughs> from a pedestrian access perspective. I mean, we, we feel like, and again, just with the future of, of who knows what happens on Poplar Point, we feel like something does need to be there. Building up to the property line is not yeah. a smart move. And so um, we we can only go so, so far, though, to have, you know, appropriately scaled buildings and all of that. So we think 20, 20 feet is as much as we're willing to go. Um, but it certainly would be a lot less gracious and I think a lot less beautiful, but it's still very functional. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, I had the same question about the, the grain silo and that it would be helpful for us to see some kind of rendering of it because it's going to be noticeable. Um, and it feels like it, it has the opportunity to be a real amenity. A real uh, yeah, the, the information, you know, the information we've been provided is about a 10 foot diameter and about 30 to 32 feet in height. But um, certainly we can try and render that to give you a better yeah. perspective. Right, because 32 feet in height, that's significant. You're, you're going to be seeing it. You're going to be seeing it from across the river, depending on where it is. Right? Understood. Yeah. Um, well, I also had a question about the loading plan, um, uh, the the promenade, which looks wonderful, but there's a lot of sort of competing competing activities along that promenade in the middle. Um, and I understand that you're looking for flexibility and you know, work with DDA and public space, whatever you need to do to sort of get it right. But if you could talk a little bit about at least what the principles are that you're you're looking to get at and how you're going to balance the competing uh, demands on that space. Yeah, I'll, I'll start, for you or Mr. Schiesel. Yeah, I was going to say I'll, I'll I'll start really quickly and then have Rob um, take it. So, I mean, one of the things is just I mean Howard Road is not a super large street, so we're trying to take. Take some of that from the traffic. I think that's there. a good move, by the way. I mean, I, I love this idea. It's more how, how is it going to function? Like, what principles do you use to make sure that you manage all those competing interests in there? Understood. Uh, Rob, do you want to hit the technical aspects of this? Yeah, sure. Um, the general thing we try to do is keep the streets as pedestrian oriented as possible, to have them work for all the modes. While also accommodating the large trucks for the grocer, and you've kind of honed right into that being one of the more difficult things on the transportation site plan here. Um, so we've we've done our studies, and there's two changes we made that were designed to try to keep everything as pedestrian oriented as possible while still getting those trucks. One, there's going to be some areas on Howard Road where you can't have parked cars, um, just to allow the trucks to swing in and out. Doesn't mean you can't have any curbside activity. You could have no parking, loading, unloading zones, other things, but something that you just can't have car storage on or other that has to be open. And then we worked a lot on the geometry of the public easement itself. Um, you kind of see where some of the, the building and there's a little bit of areas um, uh, that pop in and pop out. And, and some of that is just there's some room reserved so those trucks could get back in and out without widening the overall road. And the idea is. Um, You'll have some curbless elements in there of the design that allow for those trucks to come in and out. So we want the whole easement to look and feel like a multimodal pedestrian oriented space, but also accommodate these trucks so that when they show up, um, they could get in and out easily and the road doesn't have to be designed so it doesn't feel inviting. So, so what's, yeah. Rob, what's, the, what's that funky Dutch word that I never remember? Runa? Yes, so yeah. it feels like it's moving in that direction, but it's not, or is it, or, or do, is that the way you envision it? Or? Um, I wouldn't call it pure, like a lunar style, like shared space where everything's open and nothing's like delineated, um, like, like a traditional alley that just has nothing, no, no markings, just 20 feet. You know, this is wider. Um, you can see some of the design intent is that there'll be different style pavement markings and opportunities for some uh, visual cues that separate the space. So we want it to look very inviting for all the modes, but um, we want pedestrians to feel fine walking in the middle if they, if, you know, if they have space. We don't want them crowding to the sides. So, but when a truck shows up, there's those visual cues, different types of paving, where people then would naturally move over, and the kind of truck kind of knows where they're supposed to be. But we don't want it to start out with, you know, asphalt and curbs and not feel inviting for those other modes. So then so why, kind of, why not 
why not design it as a Vooner? Um, I'm not sure that's appropriate for uh, for to be of the garage ramp here. I think what we've somewhat discussed is as a hybrid design, take as many of those Wooner style elements and bring them in. Um, and and that just gives it again just just those type of little visual cues help organize the modes when they're all present at once. But when they're not all present at once, it makes it feel more pedestrian friendly if that's the major mode that's going on. So that's kind of the design intent. The pure Wooner would just be like all the same paving, no markings, no nothing. I I think that's a little tricky to pull off here for several reasons. One, if this road is going to connect through to a greater popular point, there are going to be other buildings that use it and then higher vehicles. So if it was always in the short term, if nothing was going to develop, I think you could pull in more of those. And in fact, because you wouldn't want traffic, say, on Howard Road, just saying, hey, I'm going to turn down here and then get stuck. Um, so you'd, you'd, you you want it to be... That's, you want it to be able to work in that short and long term. So that's why we're kind of thinking hybrid style, some elements, but not full uh, shared space. Gotcha. Yeah, I just think it's gonna be tricky because at the end of the day, when this is all built out, there's gonna be a lot of bike and pedestrian traffic on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, so so you, you have to favor that. I mean, it it has to, um, you know, I would, I would err on the side of closer to the Vooner than than not. Uh, well, as, we, as we said, we're going to be talking to Zenot about it. Yeah. You know? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank to you. Strike that balance. Um, and just oh, one yeah. other thing to note, Commissioner Shapiro, to that point, there is an additional um, access point at the um, uh, the east end of the project that is going to, you know, connect to future phases of the bridge district that's intended to be purely um, pedestrian and bicycle. So that is another through to the northern side of the project. So that provides another access point um, that won't have the vehicular conflicts. Yeah, it's, it's helpful to hear. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, and the only other thing is, uh, this is another Commissioner May point, but when you were talking about the tower element, and I, I, I agree, it's, it just felt a little insubstantial, but I couldn't tell, was that also... Was that designed as a solar canopy or is the solar canopy somewhere else? Maybe that's it a question not, for us. You're on mute. It is not, it is not designed as a solar canopy. It is just a, a breeze delay currently. So, so there is a solar canopy somewhere on there. I think I saw it. Yeah, that's over the pool deck. There's a shady part over the pool deck on the northwest corner. Okay, good. I just want to. Not over the pool that. itself, but it's creating some shade for some okay. of the seating. All right, that's that, thank you for that. Thank you for all the answers. Uh, and I do want to say, I, it's kind of where Commissioner May started as well about the reaction to it. I, I thought it was really cool looking. I thought it, I think it's a beautiful building. And and I was trying to figure out in my lack of architectural training, it feels very. I'm trying to figure out what era the precedent is, you know. And and it, so so in my mind, it felt very 1950s in a wonderful way. But I can't figure out if, if that's the right error that I'm looking at or not. It it's it matters not one whit. I was just sort of curious about in your mind if you had to sort of pick an error of what it sort of references, what does it feel like to you? I think we really feel like it's of today and of where we see the world going. Um and we're really trying to embrace those you know, really it's form follows function, right? The you uh, Commissioner may mention the the how many balconies and really we just yeah, wonderful. decided to celebrate how many different ways can we show a balcony and make it amazing and let that be the architecture. Looks like you had fun designing it, I have to say, Mr. Hart. So uh, I'll leave it at that and Mr. Chair, I have no more questions. Let me let me just say, Mr. Mr. Earl, I'm glad that you uh said you thought it was architecture of the day because sometime I wonder if we're stuck in the 50s. So so, but I, I'll bring my comments up as we move along, uh, especially on the, um, the trailers piece uh, that has been spoken to. So, let me go to Commissioner Imamura. You have any questions or comments? Uh, thank you, Chairman Ed. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate it. Uh, I do have a few questions. Um, I think that uh, Commissioner May and Commissioner Shapiro had uh, put us on a path and uh, asked a few of the questions that I had. Um, starting with the silo, so I think uh, it seems to be a, a common theme with the size and scale of the silo um, on the southeast uh, 
corner there. So certainly important enough to um, add or include in future renderings. So I think that'll be important to see. Um, I think Commissioner May had also brought up uh, color of the balcony space, uh, the frame expression and the stacking of the IZ units and uh, Commissioner Shapiro, um, certainly I think I had the same feeling you did and it was really reminiscent of uh, mid-century modern. Partly because of uh, the expression, perhaps, of the uh, balconies, the, the number of balconies. Um, so a lot of my comments here and questions uh, are for uh, Mr. Earl. I certainly don't want to second guess any of the design decisions, but this uh, project certainly has a significant physical presence. So um, I'll start with uh, the same comments uh, left by uh, Commissioner May and Commissioner Shapiro about the stacking of the IZ units. Um, on inboard. And so that was something um, that I had noticed too along the spine uh, of the building there. Um, I think uh, Commissioner Shapiro's suggestion about including at least some additional units um, outboard might be helpful, especially I think I read somewhere where uh, there was a request for flexibility with about 10% of the units. So um, I think that's worth exploring. I certainly understand uh, Mr. Earl sort of the logistics. Um, or mechanics of laying out the spaces and why those units are inboard, especially on the north uh, side, as Commissioner May had, had commented, um, just about the sun and shadow. Um, you see that or you show that on your, um, your perspectives, but I think that would also be helpful on your plan views. Uh, you've got some um, outdoor areas uh, elevated on the second floor there, um, especially on the north side, some are gonna be in shadow significant part of the day. I think you even have a trellis or a pergola um, uh, designed on the, the north side there. Uh, so I'm not sure if that's just more of an architectural element or if that actually is serving any purpose when most of the time it'll be in, in shade or shadow. So certainly something to think about. Um, the frame expression. So uh, you had mentioned, I think, the my notes here, the super frame on the northwest unit and then the horizontality of the southeast unit. So I understand the design vocabulary uh, of these individual units. I guess I, it seems a little incongruent to me and I wanted to ask Mr. Earl if you could describe how these three buildings sort of um, in their expressions, how do they uh, relate to one another? I understand probably the intent was to break up the mass into three separate masses, but can you talk about sort of the relationship of all three and where those common uh, design vocabulary elements are, are tied together? Because I, I, I might be missing it. Um, that's a great question. And, and I think at the heart of it is understanding that this is a 400 foot long block. That's considerably longer than most blocks in the district. And so we, to, to have an appropriate scale to the pedestrian in the neighborhood, it was important for us to make sure that it, um, it had a rhythm and scale that was congruent to, to successful neighborhoods, which is more in that 150 to 200 foot long length. Um, but you're right, we don't want it to read as three separate buildings. There's a reason why they're labeled as facade types on the, on the, um, on the documents. And, and that's that it is one building and it is a coherent identity. And, and so for us, that is found in both the material palette, the consistent use of cementitious panels throughout, and the fact that the framing elements, while different one, on each building, they're expressed differently. The Western building emphasizes the vertical, the Eastern building emphasizes the horizontal. Those are all the same elements and we're just using them in different ways as a kit of parts so that there's this common language of understanding of how the building goes together. That really was our intent there, to get the best of those both worlds, like a coherent building, but a pedestrian scale. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I think the uh, element on slide 25, the rooftop sort of embellishment on slide 25, I think what Commissioner May was articulating was that it's really uh, proportionally problematic. And so and I think you acknowledge that, Mr. Just to refine and revise that um, a bit would make a little more sense um, compared to, I think it was on slide 22, that um, the proportional uh, 
design of that, um, I think, felt a little better. Um, I think the commissioner may have described it as a little awkward. So um, I would probably agree with that. And I think you might too, Mr. Darrell. Point, point well taken. I think sometimes you stare at something long enough, it's always good to have a fresh set of eyes. So appreciate the thought and very happy to look at that. So um, a couple of things you had mentioned, the 400 foot long block. So I wanted to ask if you could describe um, the pedestrian experience for me on the south side. Commissioner Shapiro had, had talked a little bit about it on the north side, it's sort of this truncated promenade that's only really 20 feet. But can you describe and walk me through what that 400 foot long experience is like along Howard Road? And how we're activating public space because it feels like we're only activating public space uh, on the west and possibly the east end. Yes, and I think what may help to understand that is a street section that we have, which um, is around slide, I believe it's around slide 70. All of you the ability to pull that up. And this is a hard thing to explain, right? Because it's 400 feet. And, and part of what gives it that scale is going to be the variation in the bases of the buildings. Um, but not nearly it. So it's actually would be slide 70. If that's 70, it would be at slide 73. Um, and I, th I think there's two things that are important to that pedestrian scale. One is making sure we get the streetscape right. That's so critical. Um, and then the second is the art architectural articulation of variation down the street so that it's not all monolithic. But first to start with that, that street section, and it's, it's generous. Um, we've actually set the building off the property line by four feet to create an outdoor loose tables and chair, what we call a door yard, against the building. Uh, where the doors can swing out for some of the retailers, but most importantly, we get activity uh, in the retailers in the tables and chairs and plantings against the building. And there's an eight foot wide sidewalk, then the tree pit, and these are bioretention tree pits, so they're going to be dipped down with curbs um, and the ability to cross over them, which we think makes for a really rich environment. And then having that good step off zone against the street, that's the bones of what is going to make it successful, is giving people places to be both to walk and to pause. Um, and then separate from that is that each of these buildings has a slightly different articulated base. Uh, we talked about the horizontality of the concrete expression on the um, Eastern building, we call building three. And then on building two, the, the, the columns of the frame come down and those give different points for signage and other building elements of the retail. Um, to make it successful. And then the other thing that we did to try to really liven it up, and um, it's on slide, and I'm going to apologize because I'm going to make you go all the way back to the beginning almost here, but on slide 11, which really um, shows that public access easement. But what's really great about this, by sliding the facade in and out or having these breaks, it gives us the opportunity for corners. And that's really great because that's a retail's best friend is to have sight lines on both sides and wrap the corner um, um, so that as people are walking up and down the street, the retail isn't always perpendicular to you. You can be looking at it. So those are those are just a few of the things that we've done. I hope that's helpful, but I'm not sure if I've entirely answered your question. Uh, no, I, uh, I appreciate the explanation. Uh, the bioretention uh, tree pits, I think, are commendable. Uh, certainly, the section here is helpful. You mentioned moments or, uh, where you can take pause, but I didn't see that anywhere in the plan. If so we go back once, things. if you go back one slide, say, all oh, there is a two slides. This is a, and and I'm not sure if you can zoom in here, but what you'll see, and actually, why don't you go back? Sorry, why don't you go? Yeah, if you zoom in, that's fine. So you can see actually that um, there's a series of in and outs of the base and actually at the lobbies, the buildings set back and create these little courts. So that's a place to pause. Alternatively, also along the retail again, because the sidewalk doesn't come all the way up to the glass, we have this table and chair zone that's about four feet wide. Again, a place to sit and pause. And then the last is actually the space between the tree pits. So again, nice clear path and then 
other places to pause to stop. Not so large guess, ones necessarily, but. Okay, I, I see the table and chairs, and I guess that I was associating that with the retail space. But what you're saying is that's independent of the retail space, so. It's really inboard those moments of respite or places of respite are inboard and not outboard on the section. Exactly. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, appreciate that. Um, the other while we're, we have this planned view here, um, we know that there may be a future park in the north. And again, I don't want to second guess uh, any of the design decisions, but uh, if you could just help me understand better what the, the design thought process was to put the grocery store, the 31,000 foot grocery store on the west end versus the restaurants, which are on the east end. When, uh, you know, this is sort of that, uh, that gateway, right? So I guess why I, I'm trying to understand why the grocery would be the terminal point along Howard Road here in the future development. So just sort of curious how that evolved. Nothing. It's a great question. So the design, but just for my own edification. And it's a then. it's a really good question, and and there's two reasons. Um, one, if you're at a, if you're at an outdoor restaurant, you don't want to be sitting next to a highway. It's loud. It's noisy. And even if we have a park, that end of the block is going to be a little loud because of Suitland Parkway. And so it was important to create shelter and respite for the brewery, for their outdoor seating, and that's why it's nestled between two buildings in the block. The other reason is is really more practical, and that's for successful retail. Um, and I'm going to use an example that we probably don't all love, which is malls. Anchors are important, and anchors are what drive people to walk the length of the block and get that activity on Howard Road that's so important. And a successful and, and a brewery is a good anchor, but it's not as strong an anchor as a grocery store. It's going to really drive traffic down to that end and give people a reason to walk down there. Uh, the third, the third and very practical reason is visibility for a grocer tenant is really important. And so being able to be visible from Suitland Parkway is important to the success of the grocer and we need it to be successful. Well, I, appreciate if I, that. If I could just add to that too. I mean, in, in our initial conversations with a lot of different grocers, um, it was the West side or nothing <laughs> from an exposure standpoint. So that really forced this forced our hand here and a grocery store is. You know, when you're creating a new neighborhood, I mean, you, you, you've got to have one. So as our first priority, hearing their preferences, we, uh, we push it to the West. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, designing by committee is not very easy. So I think what you've all uh, tried to accomplish here is commendable. Your efforts for sustainability are also commendable. Um, I think with that, Mr. Chair, um, I don't have any further questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you uh, to the applicants um, team for all of your work and time and effort in bringing um, this project forward um, over, I know, uh, what's been a long time. Um, to get to this point. Um, and, um, you know, the thing about going after my other colleagues, including my new colleague, Joe and Amira, uh, you, you, they, they, even though my, the chairman hasn't spoken yet, uh, but you've, they, they cover a lot of, uh, points, uh, that need to be covered and, uh, can make my comments, uh, more brief. So I'll try to keep them brief. Uh, and just concur with basically all their, uh, all of my colleagues comments, um, thus far. Um, it's a very attractive, uh, project. It's a lot of housing, 748 units of housing, um. In a prominent, uh, location, uh, uh across the river, um, with great views, uh. Of the rest of the uh, downtown and um, the stadiums and the river, um, 748 units and 76 of which are uh, affordable, and a lot of, and half, I think half of that square footage of the affordable. I think, correct me if I'm wrong. If I say anything wrong, um, in my comments, uh, half.
of the half of the affordable are devoted to three bedroom units. Um, if you could give a breakdown, it's probably somewhere in the record and I missed it of the 748. Um, uh, how many are one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom? Um, I, I think it just be if there's going to be a post hearing submission, which it sounds like there's going to be, if we could just have that in the record or point me to it where where it already is in the record and uh, and then of each of those, uh, and we know that half of the 76 units, uh, I think it's 86,000 square feet or so of affordable uh, is three bedroom. But I, I think I just would like to see that breakdown. Um, so that's a lot of. Yeah. Mr. Miller, I was just going to note that the um, unit breakdown is at uh, in the pre-hearing submission, which is Exhibit 10A, specifically 10A2 in the record at sheet A1.04, um, has the breakdown of the unit mixes uh, per type on the upper right-hand corner. Thank you. Thank you for directing me uh, to that. That was an earlier um, exhibit. Yeah, and I. Um, Looked at it earlier and forgot about it. So when I was looking at the later exhibits today, so thank you. Um, I'll look at that again. Um, and I, I mean, I agree that with off the planning's comments and my colleagues' comments that if if you can uh, get any of the three bedroom um, affordable units on the exterior with balcony, realizing all the challenges that you stated here um but i think that that would be an important um balancing of uh all of what we're trying to accomplish of what you're trying to accomplish here um and i thank you for your community engagement with the uh well your responsiveness to office of planning on their comments and department district department of transportation and your community engagement with anc's 8a and 8c each of which we have uh letters of support unanimously supporting that that's great um uh let me just i guess confirm with mr with mr hotel cox or uh or mr Cecil rob Cecil, uh that is the applicant agreeing with all of the additional uh transportation demand management strategies and mitigations that ddot is recommending uh, and their and the condition that they've uh, at, attached to their approval on the on the private easement. Um, in general, we've agreed to the substance of of their um, conditions. We are tweaking some of the language which DDOT has agreed to, and as part of our post hearing submission, we'll be submitting that updated memo that DDOT has agreed to. Okay. Yeah, that would be helpful just to delineate that. Um, on the Grocery store, that's great. I mean, great amenity for this uh, neighborhood, for this part of the city. Um, you have a letter of intent from a grocery store. Are you able to share yet that uh, letter of intent or that might jeopardize it coming forward? I don't want to jeopardize anything going forward, but uh, if you're able to share that, now might be an opportunity to do that. Unfortunately, we, we cannot, we're under a non-disclosure agreement, but um, it's it's a, a locally based uh, grocery store, I'll say that. Okay. Well, um, I wish you good luck in your continued uh, negotiations with uh, getting that to become a reality. Uh, I agree with my colleagues on the grain silo. That sounds like a very interesting feature. Uh, I don't... I don't think we have one in the city, do we? With any of the other breweries or for any reason? I mean, we have water towers. And I, I don't know if this is going to be a tower. You said it's going to be only 32. Did you say it's only going to be 32 feet in height? Because I was envisioning something much higher. Uh, so is, is it, but you said 10 feet in diameter and 32 feet in height. Is that correct? Yeah, it was 30 to 35 feet. I think 32 is what I last saw. But, uh, I think yeah. the best correct. example. Commissioner Miller that you might see is the Bardo Brewing. I'm not sure if it's still there. It's come down actually just across the Frederick Douglass Bridge next to the uh, ballpark. That's not a permanent installation, but it's a good example of the scale 
of one of these. Sorry, what was that that you reference? Bardo Brewing, which is just across the Frederick Douglass Bridge from our site okay. next to the ballpark. Yeah. Again, that's not a permanent installation, so it's not an exact one to one. Yes. So yeah, I just be important since this is a design review case to know what the materials are. I mean, I guess it could be anything and metallic, it could be concrete, it could be brick, it could be, I don't know. I don't know what that Bardo one is. Um, but uh, it just, it, it, I'm sure you want something to be, if it's going to be permanent, to be complementary to the architecture that you put so much time and effort into. So it'd be good, useful to the extent we can get a rendering or, uh, or uh, a range of uh, potential renderings of what it might look like. Um, uh, that would be good. And how it relates to the uh, overall building. Um, the um, so uh, the balconies. I got it. I mean, eighty-five percent balconies. You know uh, that. I, I should I should have just started and stopped with that because that's. I'm in balcony. I'm in residential. Design review heaven. When I see uh, all those balconies, I've been pushing for that. For a long time, and 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 I think they're done very attractively, and uh, I think that's what people want. I think it's good for your marketing. <laughs> And it's what people need now more than ever, uh, as we've seen in the last year and a half with the need for private outdoor space. But you've done them very attractively. And the way you've broken up the buildings, um, uh, I think, is very, because is, is, it's, it's a big structure and you've broken it up, I think, in a very attractive way that makes the massing not as massive as it, it might otherwise be. Uh, I agree with the comments of my colleagues on the that white frame vertical color about the concern about that. I see what you're trying to accomplish there. Uh, but as long as that maybe you can demonstrate how that's going to wear over time. Um, and I agree also with the, uh, the comments on the, on the, tr on the architectural rooftop. Embellishment trellis, uh, it's such a. Statement building already. I'm not sure what that adds to put that thing on top. Of those corners, um, I, I for me, I mean, it's very subjective. I guess, I guess, um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't see the added value to it. But um, that's just uh, me, um, or maybe it's not just me. It's, maybe it's a couple of my colleagues as well. Um, and the league gold and the other environmental features are very uh, commendable. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I think I will end my comments and turn it back to you. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. Let me thank all my colleagues for their comments. Um, I, I do want to say the reason I go last, Vice Chair Miller, as you, as you probably already know, in watching the city council over the years, Ms. Crop and all the chairmen, I, I do actually watch the learn structure. And the chairmen have always, well, I've actually mentioned that to former Mayor Gray and former Chairman Gray and former, well, he's still a council member. But anyway, I watched what they have done and I have, that has been my practice uh, when I became chair first here on the Zoning Commission in 2000. So hopefully I've been, unless it's something just burning, I have to do it right away, but I usually yield to my colleagues. Um, I think my colleagues have asked some, some fa fabulous questions. Uh, let me just say that the, I, I wanna associate myself with Commissioner May as well. Um, and sometimes I don't remember everything because time does go by. It's quite a bit of time since we first started this uh, round of questioning. But I, I do have a issue with the, I think it's the West, I believe it's the West. Um, yeah, it's the West building materials, the light color. And I think Commissioner May has expounded upon that previously. If they can be cleaned, uh, I'm not really sure, but I, I've always, I've joined him uh, over the years and having concerns with with light materials, um, because I've seen some of the buildings that we have approved, I'm not gonna name where they are, but now they look horrendous. So I wanna make sure that we don't, we, we don't go into that, because because Mr. Snyder, as I, I've watched over the time, the commitment, and I believe this is a project that's in community, has a lot of community engagement, a lot of support behind it. So I'm not in the, in the operation, in the process of trying to unravel what a community has put together. So that's kind of where I am on this. But as far as the embellishment, 
uh, over the West building and the East building. Um, I, I was thinking as, as I was after Commissioner May had mentioned some of those, I, I do, I, I didn't agree at first, but I do kind of agree with the East building. Uh, it, it looks kind of light uh, as he stated. Uh, I thought that was the newer ac architecture. I actually liked it, but I, let me just ask this, Mr. Um, uh, Earl, what, what is the purpose of it? What, what is it doing up there? I think somebody asked this earlier, but what is the, especially the East building, the, the West building, I could, I think to me is suitable, but the East building, what, what is the purpose of it? You're referring to the architectural embellishment? Correct. It's creating an anchor to identify the building as you move down Howard from the, from the East. That's what it's doing. So it's but it's certainly, an anchor. If you're walking from the Metro, it's an orienting element. Walk towards the tower, see the tower. That's where the brewery is. That's where the grocery store is. So it, it becomes a, a, a point of direction and, and an orienting element in the neighborhood. So, sort of like the big chair over in the South. It's sort of like the big chair. It's an identification. Okay, okay. All right, well, I, I'll take my comments back <laughs> uh, because I just wanted to understand what the thought behind it. And I think my colleagues kind of got to that. Um, but if, if you want to revisit that one, I don't necessarily have any heartburn personally. Uh, and I know sometimes it's kind of rough when, when it's, it was uh, designed by committee, uh, I think was mentioned by my new colleague, but I, I know sometimes that can be kind of rough, but this is a, it's five of us. And, uh, you know, you have to weigh what, you know, you have to look where the votes are. I don't necessarily have a heartburn with that. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you said it's, it's an identifier. And I think that's important. Um, Ms. Hollow Cox, I'm not sure if I would ask this next question to either you, Ms. Hollow Cox, or Mrs. Snyder. I, I did read in your report, Exhibit 3, page 10, about the racial equity lens. Just expound upon me. I've read what you put in there, but it's just expound upon me how you think this meets the racial equity lens besides the affordable housing, besides the three bedrooms. I want to hear something different because I, I actually can help you with that argument, but I want to hear what you have to say. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll take that and then, um, Britt, feel free to, to jump in if you have anything else to add. Um, you know, from our perspective, when we were analyzing this project with the new comprehensive plan, um, racial equity lens, I think one of the key pieces is the fact that there is no displacement either of, you know, existing retail or, you know, kind of established businesses or any residents. Um, so I think that is a key part. I think um, one of the things I mentioned in my opening, one of the issues that um, I know the comprehensive plan and then general racial equity reports have addressed is the fact that black and brown communities within the district and within the country overall have borne the brunt of environmental um, negative impacts through industrial um, locations, through climate change, um, and having less protections around the environment. And so we think that the um, enhanced environmental and sustainability requirements that are part of the NHR zoning and also part of this project from um, the LEED Gold certification requirements and the significant renewable energy um, that is required, as well as one of the things we didn't touch on, but was in OP's report and DOEE's comments um, about the fact that this is being, you know, lifted out of the floodplain, um, ensuring that the building is not within the 500 year floodplain and focusing on resiliency, um, bringing those environmental benefits to Ward 8, we think is very important and is part of that racial equity lens. Um, I would also just refer to OP's report. Um, they go through I think very um, in a very detail oriented fashion in their report, um, the racial equity lens, in addition to um, the IZ and the, the, the affordable housing and the three bedroom units. Um, they also talk about the um, job opportunities that this creates. I'm sure the commission remembers when we originally did the PUD for this site, one of the um, benefits that the commission was really excited about and uh, Chairman Hood, I remember you were very excited about the internship opportunities that Red Brick was going to create. And so as part of the zoning and as part of Red Brick's ongoing commitment to the community, that has continued to be a part of what they are doing with this project. They've already been hiring you know, local high school students and college students as interns. Um, once construction gets underway for these projects, there will be construction 
construction internships on top of just the general business and re, um, real estate internships that students have been undergoing. And so that job training and that commitment to hiring local individuals, um, both local existing businesses as well as students, um, I think is very important and is part of that racial equity lens. So I think those are the um, kind of key pieces. One other piece I would note, um, and this is also in OP's report, um, is the focus on healthy community. And I think in addition to the um, environmental benefits, the, the walkability, the pedestrian oriented nature, uh, the promenade, whether it be the 20 feet or the 60 feet um, with the focus on um, safe bicycle infrastructure, um, all go toward that racial equity lens. Thanks, Thanks Megan. I'll just add just one thing, because you covered most of it there is, um, that we're really looking to bring in local businesses from from Ward 8 and actually um, offering them discounted rents to be able to come into our project. We think that's really important. And as Megan talked about, I mean, the amount of, you know, really meaningful workforce training, um, apprenticeships, seminars, those sorts of things for the local residents we think is extremely important. And we had an amazing, uh, High school intern this past uh, past summer for um, who was Ward A resident and he's and now gone on to West Virginia University and studying technology so uh, he can come back to Red Brick whenever he wants. It's just it, it's been a, a great program already and we look forward to expanding that as we uh, start to put these buildings into production. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, thank you both. I, I really appreciate Ms. Hardcox and Mr. Snyder your comments and and Ms. Hardcox. I'm still excited. Uh, and the reason I'm still excited is because even though the PUD went through that process, which I think again was a missed opportunity, and, and we're back here where we are now, Red Brick has not withdrawn any of what they've offered, even in this situation. To me, that continues to enhance the uh, racial equity lens. So when I look at stuff like that, I look at what, what an African does, because you didn't have to do it. You didn't have to do it, but you didn't pull anything back. You stay persistent, and you're still helping to level the playing field for some some of the people who are disadvantaged in this community. And that's what that racial equity lens is all about. So I, I appreciate it. I don't necessarily have a whole lot more architectural questions. I don't know if my colleagues left any, a whole lot more left for me to ask. Uh, Commissioner May has another one, but, but I think that's all I have. And let me do the second round as I see him. But I, I, again, I wanna say, I really appreciate what Red Brick is. And I probably have said that maybe a hundred times, but I mean it sincerely. Uh, Commissioner May. Yeah, I have um, a couple of other thoughts. Um, the first one is just a question. Who's going to actually rebuild Howard Road through there? Is that going to be part of your development expense or is DDOT doing a new road structure there or are you just going to attach your building to the existing Howard Road? That's that's going to be part of our overall infrastructure cost for the for the whole bridge district. So, okay, it's um yeah, it, it it's a lot of work to make a to create a neighborhood, and that's certainly one. No kidding. That's, that's why I'm I'm asking. It's like because it'd be you know you're gonna have this bright shiny new thing, and then like have the existing Howard Road servicing, you know, would be a disappointment. Um, the um the I I I know we're not reviewing the street section, but I'm not. I did not see in the drawing that one drawing that showed it. I didn't see um, um, protected bicycle lanes. Is is that going to be part of the project in the long run? Uh, along how? Uh, well, the, well the, the the idea is again to take some of that stress off of Howard Road and put it onto the promenade. That would be our our hope. And um, again, having taking people and bikes uh, towards on the back of the or the north side of the buildings. Yeah, would be our our hope certain. Yeah. So let me and, let, and either way. Yeah, um, I, I would I would give that a lot of thought and I would talk to some people who ride bikes because, you know, given the choice of going on the promenade or going, you know, straight to the bridge, if that's where I want to go, I'm going to I'm going to stay on the street. And uh, and I think a lot of other cyclists are the same way. It's just it's, you know, we and we, we've been through this in the Park Service where we, you know, we built a trail through Georgetown Waterfront Park that we thought the cyclists would use. And nobody used it and everybody drove down K Street instead. And so now there's a K Street protected bike lane that was added. So it's a lesson learned. The uh, Mr. May, oh, I would yeah. make a couple it, points there. Um, the promenade actually connects 
pretty directly to the Oval. The Howard Road connects to Suitland Parkway. So it's actually a, a really good direct connection. We also envision um, that there would be a dedicated bicycle facility within the promenade to avoid some of the examples that you just mentioned about in Georgetown. So it would truly have a, a dedicated facility there that would that would be a higher quality than just a shared space with like you, what you what you originally would pop in the head when you think of the word promenade with pedestrians and bicycles in the same spot. <laughs> okay, again, lessons learned there because the um, one of the reasons why it didn't work so well in Georgetown was because pedestrians were were using it and just sort of strolling three or four across. Um, and it's also why I think um, the bike lanes along the wharf have not been a, um, they're not a great success from a cyclist perspective because they're at the same grade. And uh, I tell you, every time I've ever ridden down there, I'm, you know, hit my bell and yelling the whole time because there are people stepping into that bike lane. And, and I don't blame them because, it, you know, the design of the, of the street of that, of the section there, invites people to do that. I don't blame them for do it, but I also, you know, I want to get through there fast. So I think one of the reasons it's very be you would run into very many of the same issues on Main Avenue at the front or if we tried to fit them into Howard Road. So our this was our solution is to keep Howard Road nice and slow. Um yeah. widen the sidewalks. If the bike should feel comfortable in the in the narrow travel lanes there, but then create a very high quality uh connection. There just wasn't a room for both. Um but that's kind of based on how the spacing of everything worked out that we thought. And, the, and I, when we we'll get down to the details of the promenade, I think we'll have to take what you're, exactly what you're talking about into account. Keeping the pedestrians off of that dedicated portion of the promenade is, would be key to making it work. Right. And so within the 20 feet, is that where you're going to put that <clears throat> bicycle infrastructure? Or are you counting on the extra 40 from the park survey? Uh, no, I, no, I, we I would mean, put it in the 20 feet no. if we could not. You're going to put it in the 20 feet? If, if we could not get the... Uh, with, with, Primarily bicycle based um, promenade. All right. Well, it's only in the 20 feet. I'm sure you guys can figure it out, but there are as I said, many lessons already learned and many, you know, post um, uh, after good ideas are implemented, then there are other things that wind up, you know, changing um, because they were maybe not as good as we thought they were. They were. So be careful of that. Second thing is about parking uh, for cars and specifically for grocery stores and um i don't i don't need to get deeply into this or i don't necessarily need answers but i would encourage whoever is involved in i mean i would say everybody i can see here except for the commissioners should just like drive around and sample the various parking garages that have built and been built in connection with grocery stores um because within um I would say a mile, maybe a mile and a half. There are half a dozen examples of grocery stores with um, below grade parking. And um, a couple of them are very good. A couple of them are really bad. And for different reasons, right? One of the reasons, and this is one of the things I think you should be concerned about, is the path that you have to get, you have to drive to get to the parking section and close to the elevator that serves the grocery store. Right now you have people going in, turning right, and then basically reversing themselves and going to the opposite end of the building. Uh, that's similar to a, a grocery store very close to me that that uh, it's not only that, but it's it's also a really contorted route um, within that within that um, um, parking structure. So it, it's it's a, a lesson in, in kind of how you don't really want to do it. Um, another is a, an example, uh, again, very close to here, um, where the um, it's it's just feels very very crowded, and it is it's really as a result dark, dingy, and frankly underutilized. Uh, I don't know whether it's underutilized because they just built more parking than they needed, or whether it's because it's so unattractive that people don't even want to go in there. And so uh, I would just, I would drive around and look at them all and, you know, go in there as if you were doing the shopping and see what it's like. The most, the one that was built most recently, and I won't name the name, but it's right near Potomac Avenue Metro, not the one closest to Potomac Avenue Metro, the one just a little north. It has a really great 
situation. When you drive straight in, you do have to double back, but you're not, you know, there's no conflict or combination with the, re the retail parking. It's a very high ceiling space. It's bright and airy and very attractive. And, and I say all these things in part because I, I, my, my wife for her work has to go to a lot of grocery stores. I won't explain her business, but and I hear it all the time about parking garages. Um, so there are lessons to be learned, and I just hope you will get out there and learn them. The point we'll take in commissioner and something we've spent a lot of time on and we'll continue to, I agree with you. It has to work and work well and be bright and inviting or yeah. it won't be successful. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Sorry for my little bit of a rant. Thank you. Uh, before I go to you, Commissioner Spear, I want to just remark on uh, the comments that Commissioner May. I would agree, uh, Commissioner May. Years ago, I was one who was pushing for some of those things that happened. And I agree, you have to kind of strike that balance and try to find out the happy medium. Uh, but sometime at that time, I think it's like predicting the future. And, and you didn't know, you know what the future is. As far as access and ingress and egress, that's a different story. But as far as how much parking is there, some of them I, I think that we might have missed the mark. Some of them I think that we won the mark, but again, it's it's like predicting in the future and, and nobody knows what the future is. Uh, no human knows what the future is. So let me go to Commissioner Shapiro. Oh, and let me just say this, Commissioner May, I didn't know you were that type of classical rock, blowing the horn and telling people to get out the lane. I, I haven't seen that. I have to see you one day in opera in, in action. <laughs> well, you know, if you stand in the bike lane, you might get a dose of that. Well, I, I had made the mistake crossing Pennsylvania Avenue and stood in the back. They were very courteous. Baby, could you excuse me? They didn't come by blowing the horn mag as I was standing. I, I, have to, I, have to, I will know who you are if you do that. I'm, I'm ringing a dinky little bell. <laughs> but I, but I can't yell pretty loud if it's, if it's a dangerous situation. So. I, I will say, though, the bicycle ride in the city, I believe, has improved from when we first got really going with bicycle lanes. So. Mr. Shapiro, let me let you go before I get in trouble. No, I was, I was just wondering when you're when you're going to go on a bike ride with Commissioner Matt that he's invited you to. Uh, I had a bike, and I actually called Commissioner Matt. I had a bike, and I was getting ready to get started, but I got on, and I'm not going to say what happened. But let me go to you, Commissioner Shapiro. <laughs> <laughs> so I just this is for Ms. Hollicott. So I, I'm just thinking about the discussion around the the. Uh, the racial equity lens and the uh, the steps that you all have taken. It's not so much about the steps that you have taken because it, it sounds like you've done lots of good work. It's more about how it's presented to us. And even as you were talking about it, you were referring to what OP mentioned in their report. And I just think we, uh, you know, it, this would be a good example of it. And I think we, we should be attentive to this with other projects that come before us is to find ways to have it be much more thoroughly documented and highlighted in your in your presentation to us um, and so you know you, you have it all right but we shouldn't have to dig for it i guess is the way i would say it and so perhaps you could put something together that lays out all the things that you've talked about um, and again it's less about commenting on what you have or haven't done because it's quite commendable and more about helping us do our work not just with you, but with projects to come before us. So I'll leave it at that, Mr. Chair. And I think I would concur with Commissioner Shapiro's comments as well. Uh, make it identifiable because you all have done a lot of work. The only reason we know that because we had a PUD with you. We had people in the here. That's when we were meeting in the hearing room. So we already kind of knew some of the work you've been doing and the community has told us. So anyway, I would agree with Commissioner Shapiro. We probably want to uh, supplement the, the record. Uh, and make it really pop out at us. Okay. Any other second round? Anybody? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Imamura. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just real quick, um, I, I echo uh, Commissioner Shapiro's comments. Um, and this Hall Cox, uh, your comment about environmental justice, I think was uh, really key and essential. So certainly include that uh, point as well. Um, I think that uh, this has the potential to uh, this project here has the potential to be a, a very healthy and vibrant place to live, work, and play. So certainly, um, a lot of work and effort has gone into this. 
one thing that I, I might have missed. Um, so it was clearly evident a lot of green walls uh, in the project, uh, your effort uh, to um, add several of those kinds of spaces. I was just curious, did anybody quantify the carbon sequestration? It's not something we have at our fingertips. It's something we're really working hard on and we think it's gonna be a key part of the construction story of the building. Uh, and um, As it develops, I think it's something we've been excited to share more later. So a little too early to say, but something that we're paying a lot of attention to. Uh, that's good to hear with all the effort uh, that you've put behind uh, sustainability. I think that would be um, an essential element uh, to that story. So I look forward to hearing more about that, your effort there. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Any other follow-ups? Not seeing Michelle, do we have any more from ANC 8A or 8C here for any cross? I looked and I did not see any of the names from um, either ANC. Okay. Mr. Young, let's bring up, thank you, Michelle. Mr. Young, let's bring up uh, Officer Planning and DDOT. Hey, Mr. Jessica and Ms. Baca. And Mr. Jessica, when you get ready, you may begin. And right after you finish, Ms. Baca, you may begin, and we'll ask our questions after you both finish. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. Um, again, my name is Matt Jessica, and I'll be presenting OP's testimony in this case. The Office of Planning reviewed this application under the relevant criteria of Subtitle K, Chapter 10, and Subtitle X, Chapter 6. And OP is very supportive of the overall project, both the architecture and the site planning. And the building would help to achieve many of the goals of the Northern Howard Road Zone, um, maybe the primary being uh, activating Howard Road itself. And we feel that the design would uh, create a very active streetscape. Uh, we also appreciate that the design attempts to activate all four sides of the building, uh, both the Howard Road side, the two ends of the building, as well as uh, the rear facing the National Park Service property. Um, we also appreciate that the, the design concentrates the loading and parking functions in the uh, central alley or public access easement that goes through the building. And that also helps to uh, protect protect the pedestrian and bicycle environment. Uh, we do, like uh, Commissioner Miller said, we really appreciate the, the number of balconies on this building. Uh, we hope that this would be a new standard for other buildings going forward. Uh, we did have the, the one concern which the, the commission already addressed uh, regarding the uh, light and air availability to the three bedroom units, the three bedroom IZ units specifically. Uh, so we're glad that the applicant will be taking a, a second look at that. Uh, but overall, the project would meet the, the uh, criteria of the design review regulations. Uh, and again, OP is very supportive of the project and we'll be happy to recommend approval uh, once that last issue has been addressed. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jessica. You can hold tight. Ms. Walker, do that. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, my name is Kimberly Vaca with the District Department of Transportation. Uh, DDOT is supportive of the requested approval of the design review application. Uh, the proposed development is expected to generate 166 inbound and outbound AM peak hour trips and 307 PM inbound and outbound PM uh, peak hour trips. As such, the applicant was required to submit a comprehensive transportation review or CTR study. Um, the applicant is proposing 359 off street vehicle spaces in a below grade parking garage, which is 80 spaces more than DDOT's preferred parking maximum. The study assumed 40 to 55% of trips would travel by vehicle, with the remainder traveling by walking, biking, or transit. Uh, given the high parking ratio, DDOT required the applicant to mitigate the transportation impact through a transportation demand management or TDM plan. Uh, since DDOT's October 19th report, the applicant and DDOT have met to discuss DDOT's proposed recommendations to modify the applicant's TDM plan. Uh, DDOT and, and the applicant have come to an agreement for a revised TDM plan per the Grove Slade memo dated October 29th, 2021. The applicant is also proposing a private roadway from Howard Road Southeast to the bike and pedestrian promenade on the northern edge of the site per an easement agreement. 
The easement was drafted in such a way that the driveway can be extended northward as a more traditional street to provide connectivity to any development that occurs on the NPS land. DDOT would like the applicant to include DDOT standard materials as required by the agreement, um, and DDOT would like a more detailed review of the design elements of the public access easement and recommends that the Zoning Commission allows flexibility on the design of the private roadway for future discussion with DDOT. Um, finally, the proposed development meets DDOT's requirements for loading by providing head in and head out movements from the proposed private driveway off of Howard Road Southeast. Overall, DDOT supports the project and welcomes any questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jessic and Ms. Baca. Let's see if we have any questions or comments. Uh, commissioners, Commissioner May, Commissioner Shapiro, uh, Commissioner Imamore, and Vice Chair Miller. Uh, no questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Jessic and Ms. Baca, for your reports. I have no questions as well. I, I appreciate your reports. Let's see, uh, does Afghan have any cross or questions? Ms. Holocox? No questions. Okay. All right, uh, and again, I don't believe we have anyone here from 8A and 8C. They do have letters. I'll be reading those shortly. Uh, so thank you both. We appreciate your, your uh, reports. Okay, report of other government agencies has already been mentioned. Uh, we did have a report from DHCD, and we had reports from DOE. DOE actually applauded uh, the Sustainability Measures Incorporated. Um, DHCD noted so OP that it has no objections, uh, and it talks about the um, specifically addition of the IZ floor area of the 50 percent MFI levels. Uh, I think I've gotten all those. Okay, uh, the report of the ANC again, Michelle. Let me call for ANC 8A and 8C while I pull up their reports. There are they are not on. Okay. Neither. Let me. Uh, I'm gonna ask the vice chair if he could do 8C. I will do 8A. Do you have AC handy? You go. Okay, that's all right. I know. I, I uh, was looking at it online because it just came in today. I... Right. Okay, that's okay. We do have a letter uh, from Chairperson Muhammad, uh, which basically says that, uh, that the ANC 8A voted unanimously 7 0 to 0 to support the application for design review in the NR NHR zone for square 5860 and lot 97 and assigned by. Chairperson Muhammad, that's from 8A, and from 8C, from uh, Chairperson Adolfo, uh, ANC 8C, let me see what the vote was. It says ANC 8C voted unanimously, so they have two unanimous votes from both ANCs. Uh, 8C's, 8C has a vote of 6 and 0, and that's also in our record and our exhibit. Okay, um, Michelle, do we have anyone here to testify or organizations or persons here to testify either in support, opposition, or undeclared? There were no witnesses um, registered to testify in any category. Okay, thank you. It looks like the work has already been done. Uh, this is a prime example that shows that the community has definitely been engaged and, and a lot of stakeholders have been a part of this process. So thank you again. I can't reiterate that because a lot of times we don't, some t a, a number of times that doesn't even happen. So this is uh, another model uh, of, of exemplary application as far as I'm concerned. Okay, uh, Ms. Holocox, I know you don't have any rebuttal, but I have to ask, and do you have any closing? No rebuttal as expected. Um, and in closing, we just want to thank the commission for the time. We understand what the commission has asked for as part of um, our post hearing submission. So we're happy to um, put that together and submit it into the record, um, depending on the timing that the commission and um, Michelle Allen would like. Okay, and I believe, is this a one vote case? It is. Okay, this is a one vote case. All right, so that rules that out. All right, um, so let's see, commissioners, any final comments or uh, questions? Everybody uh, is on board, Ms. Holocox and Ms. Shellen know what the commissioners have asked for. Uh, and let me ask my colleagues, are there any final comments? Looking, just looking to see if anybody has any. Okay. Um, okay, Ms. Shellen, can we come up with some dates? Yes. Uh, Ms. Holocox, do you think that you guys could provide everything that's needed in one week, or do you need more time? I believe we can do one week. Okay. I'm just trying to determine if you want 
if we can go for action this month or if we're going to go for action next month because we only have one meeting this month. We'd like to target this month so um, we okay. can get it in in a week. Okay, so if we could have um, your submissions by uh, 3 o'clock PM on November 8th. Sorry, I lost my papers here. That would be 3 PM on the 8th of November. And the uh, parties would have until 3 p.m. on the 15th. If you could let the ANCs know. Um, and then we could put this on the 1118 agenda for consideration. And they only, you can let them know, they only need to respond if they choose to de do so. Since they are in support, they may choose not to respond to the submissions. And if you could provide um, draft findings, facts, conclusions of law, um, I know our legal counsel likes to receive that sooner rather than later. So if you could provide that draft in a week also, 3 p.m. on the 8th, that would be great. Yes. And we'll put this on, as I said, for 4 o'clock p.m. on the 8th, 18th. And that's all we have. Okay, thank you, Ms. Shannon, Ms. Hannah Cox. Do we have anything, any other further comments? All right, um, the Zona Commission will be meeting again um, this coming November the 4th on these same platforms at 4 p.m. We have Zona Commission case number 12-15C, Guided at University, and we have Zona Commission case number 15-24B, JBG slash 6th Street Associates, LLC, and Guided at University. I want to thank everyone for their participation in my, tonight. And Mr. E. Memorial, how did you enjoy your first hearing? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it went really well. Okay, good, good. All right. So again, I want to thank everyone for their participation tonight. And this here this hearing is adjourned. Good night and have a nice evening. Thank you.